Hello, everyone, and welcome to phyloseminar.org. The current theme is phylogenetic invariants, which are polynomial relationships on data generated from a tree. In this series of three talks, we are hearing three perspectives on invariants and how they may be used to make inferences. First, we heard from Marta Casanellas Rias, who introduced the topic and brought us up to date. Today, we'll have Laura Kubatko describe coalescent based inference using invariants. And after that, Barbara Holland will describe Markov invariants and how they differ from classical phylogenetic invariants. I want to remind people that the Q&A app is gone now, so you can ask questions through Twitter or IRC as described on the attending section of the Phyla Seminar website. As I mentioned, today's speaker is Laura Kubatko. Laura has spent much of her career at Ohio State, starting with her master's in statistics, then her PhD in biostatistics. After graduation, she took a position at the University of New Mexico, where she stayed until 2000, and returned to OSU, where she has been ever since. Laura has been full professor since 2013 and has played a leadership role at the Mathematical Bioscience Institute. Welcome, Laura, and thanks for participating. All right. Thank you very much, Eric, for the nice introduction and for inviting me to be part of this. Let me spend a minute here to get the slides up. Okay, can you see the slides? Looks great. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thanks again, and I'd like to thank Marta also for giving such a nice introductory talk that will make my job a little bit easier as I talk about how to extend invariance to the coalescent-based phylogenetic setting. So I'll just start with a bit of an introduction and a recap and go back to many of the things that Marta mentioned in her talk. Um, to begin, I want to just um, restate our overall goal, the same goal that Marta listed, which is to infer the correct phylogenetic tree from a given alignment of sequence data. And in this talk, when we think about how to do that, we'll be thinking about using invariants, which as Eric mentioned in the introduction, are polynomials and the site pattern probabilities. So I thought it would be good to just start with a reminder of what we mean by a site pattern probability. So you can see in the tree in the lower left corner, um, we have a very simple phylogenetic tree on four taxa. Um, the taxa are labeled uh, one, two, three, and four. And beneath the taxa, I've shown um, a possible nucleotide that might be found in the alignment at a particular position for each of the taxa. So in that example, um, taxon 1 has letter A, taxon 2 has nucleotide C, and 3 and 4 have A. So throughout the talk, I use the notation P sub uh, ACAA, for example, to represent the probability of this particular site pattern at a position in the alignment. Um, in Marta's talk, she defined three different types of invariants, and I'll just restate those definitions here as I'll refer to those kinds of things in the phylogenetic setting, the coalescent-based phylogenetic setting throughout the talk. Um, so the first thing that Marta mentioned were phylogenetic invariants, um, which were polynomial relations satisfied by any joint distribution that has evolved under a fixed evolutionary model on the tree. Um, which can be distinguished from topology invariants, phylogenetic invariants of a tree T that are not satisfied on some joint distributions on some other tree topologies. And these are the ones that are used to distinguish between different topologies. So I'll give an example of these two in just a minute. Um, finally, Marta defined edge invariants, topology invariants that are identified by collapsing the joint distribution of the leaves around a particular edge. And I'll also give an example of how we might find edge invariants. So um, to start, let's think now of two different um, four taxon phylogenetic trees, um, which I've shown here. They differ in who is sister to taxon one. So in the tree on the left, uh, taxa one and two are sister taxa, and then the tree on the right, taxa one and three are sister taxa. Um, and we'll assume a nice simple model for this example. We'll assume that we have um, the Jukes Cantor model, the JC69 model. And for those who are not so, so familiar with the models, this model just says that all of the four uh, nucleotides are equally frequent. So they each occur 25% of the time. Um, and that uh, changing, the probability of changing from any one nucleotide to any of the others is the same. Um, and the probability of remaining the same is, the, is, is equal across the four nucleotides as well. Um, so in these two trees, uh, the branch lengths are drawn to scale, so we'll actually think of a molecular clock assumption being satisfied here so that the distance from each tip back to the root is the same. And if we think about this model and think about the true two trees, we can see that the expression that I have below will be a phylogenetic invariant. So I have um, P uh, a, 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 plus C, 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 minus G, 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 T, 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 T. Those will all have the same probabilities. All four of those will have the same probabilities under the um, jukes Kanner model. And so uh, that polynomial will evaluate to zero 
on any tree that we, that we write down. So that is a phylogenetic invariant, but it won't help us to distinguish between topologies. Um, in contrast, if we think about uh, this invariant, uh, PACAA minus PCAAA, then for the tree on the left, under, again, the jukes kanner model and with the molecular clock assumption, those two site pattern probabilities should be the same. It's just a rotation of the labels A and C around the sister taxa 1 and 2. Um, and so that will evaluate to 0 for the tree on the left. But for the tree on the right, we will not have um, a difference in those site pattern probabilities of 0. And so this one will be a topology invariant that would help us distinguish these two topologies. Um, finally, I just want to give a quick example of an edge invariant. Um, and so again, we have a four taxon tree as an example. And um, if you've watched Marta's talk, you'll see that she collapses this the set of all site pattern probabilities. There will be 256 of them in total for a tree with four taxa um, into a 16 by 16 matrix, where the rows of the matrix are indexed by possible nucleotides for the first. Well, that's okay. <laughs> I just finished the hard part where I define the coalescent model. Is this is this where yeah, I left yeah. Yeah, Can so we, we had just seen about uh, edge invariance and, and the flattening matrix. Yep. Okay, so, so I'll start here, which is the relationship between gene trees and species trees. Um, okay, so, so what I was leading up to is to now move into what's different between this talk and the uh, talk that we saw from Marta, and that is that we're now going to focus on estimating the species tree versus the gene trees. So. Um, here's a picture that I think nicely displays the difference between gene trees and species trees. Um, and the idea here is that when we collect, um, when we collect information um, from many loci, we may have different evolutionary histories for the different genes. So this picture is from an article in Nature where you can see that they're thinking of the problem of inferring the evolutionary relationships between human, chimp, and gorilla. And for gene one, for example, the evolutionary history of that segment of DNA places human and chimp most closely related with gorilla as the outgroup. Gene two has that same relationship, but when we look at the evolutionary history for gene three, that has human and gorilla most closely related, uh, um, followed by chimp as the outgroup. And we can move down the chromosome, um, and we see gene five has the other possibility, gorilla and chimp most closely related, and then human as the outgroup. So each of these um, segments of DNA may have its own distinct evolutionary history. These are what we refer to as the gene trees. But what's often of interest is actually the species tree, and that is the thing that we would um, like to recover. And so we need to sort of think about the relationship between the gene tree and the species trees. So this next picture has a lot going on, but um, shows how we're going to think about the relationship between gene trees and species trees under the phylogenetic coalescent model. Um, so let me highlight different parts of the picture to try to show you what's going on. What I've highlighted right now is this outline tree, which will represent the species tree. So starting at the top of, say, panel A and moving down the tree, um, we see that at the first horizontal dotted line, we have a first speciation event. And that event separates species A from the um, uh, ancestor of species B and C. Um, and at the second horizontal dotted line, we have another speciation event, which separates species um, B and C into distinct species. In all four of the subpanels, the species tree is the same. So what we're going to um, think about modeling first is the relationship between the gene trees and the species tree. So now let's talk about the gene trees. Um, we have now the gene trees highlighted in this uh, light blue color here. And let's again start with the, um, the uh, figure in um, panel A, um, if we start now at the bottom of the tree and work our way up, we see that there's a lineage sampled from B and a lineage sampled from C. And um, following them back, we see a black dot, which represents um, what might be referred to as either a gene divergence event or a coalescent event. It represents the point at which those two gene lineages share a common ancestor. And then following that ancestral lineage back, we see that there's a coalescent event with the lineage sample from species A above the root. If we look at the, um, the gene tree that is associated um, with this, um, this particular gene tree, we can see that it matches the species tree. So here the gene tree and the species tree agree with one another in terms of their topology. If we look now at panel B, we see that the 
um, gene tree and species tree share the same topology, but that the, the coalescent event happens at a different time. The coalescent event be between B and C happens at a different time, and it happens above the root of the phylogenetic tree. So B and C did not share a, a common ancestor within the interval between those two horizontal dotted lines that has length tau. If we look now at panel C and D, we see that once there's not a coalescent event in the interval of length tau, um, there's the possibility that the lineages sampled from B and C do not coalesce with one another first. So for example, subpanel D shows the case where the lineage sampled from A coalesces with that sampled from C, and B is the outgroup, and then the panel in C shows the opposite relationship. Okay, so what we want to think about then is how to, to model this um, situation probabilistically. And so we'll define tau to be the length of the interval between speciation events. And I think about tau in coalescent units, where my definition of a coalescent unit is the number of 2n generations. So just to make this a little bit concrete, um, here's an example. Suppose that we have 1.2 coalescent units, um, and this is for an organism with a population size of 10,000 and a generation time of three years. That coalescent unit 1.2 would correspond to 72,000 years in real time. So a nice, um, a nice feature of talking about coalescent units is that they can easily be translated to whatever particular organisms um, different people are working on. So they sort of have a meaning that then translates to the particular study system pretty straightforwardly. So we'll think about coalescent units in this talk. And what I want to do is just give an idea of how the coalescent model works. And then we'll, we'll define things a bit more formally in just a minute. So what I've shown here in this slide is the four um, gene trees from the previous slides. Um, where the tree from A is in red on the left, the tree from panel B is the black one, the tree from D is the blue one, and the tree from C is the, the teal one on the right. And what I've written under the trees is the probability of that particular topology occurring under the coalescent model. Note that the two trees on the left actually share the same topology but just differ in the timing of the coalescent events. So if we wanted just the probability of that topology, we would add those two together. So just to give you an idea of how this works, it's nice to see some numbers sometimes. So if we had a coalescent um, unit of one for tau, then we would have about 63% of the time the tree, gene tree um, in red that matches, as well as the matching tree in black has about 12% probability. So a total of, um, I guess we have 75% probability for, the, for that topology that matches the species tree. And then 12% probability of, the, of each of the two ways of mismatching with the species tree. If we lengthen the length, if we shorten the length of the interval, then of course we get more um, variation in the histories in the sense that now the probability of matching uh, the gene tree matching the species tree is only about 60%. We have 20% of the other two topologies. And if we lengthen the interval, so we make it two, then of course the probability of matching the species tree goes up. And that's because there's more time for the coalescent event to occur. Okay. Um, the complication with the coalescent model in general is that there are a lot of these ways of drawing gene trees within the species tree. So if we just look at matching, I'm going to go back a couple slides. If we just look at matching, there were two ways for the gene tree to match the species tree. So that was the gene tree depicted in A and the gene tree depicted in B. So two ways to get a match. And then forwarding through to my table here, um, that was for three taxa. If we have four taxa, and we have an asymmetric tree, there are five ways to get a match. For five taxa, there are 14 ways. And for 20 taxa, there are a ton of ways to get a match, let alone the number of ways to draw the non-matching gene trees within the species tree. So computations become very hard if we need to think about each of these gene tree histories individually. And unfortunately, we do, because the mutation process occurs on these histories. So that means that things like calculating the likelihood and therefore using likelihood-based methods for inference will be very difficult, especially for large-scale data. Okay, so now I'll just spend a minute um, stating the, the phylogenetic coalescent model a little more formally um, so that we can get an idea of, of what's happening here. So the notation will be to, re to let capital G represent the gene tree topology with the vector T um, being the set of coalescent times on that topology. 
capital S will represent the species tree, and tau will represent the vector speciation times. And so there is an example below where each um, branch of the species tree is shaded a different color. Um, the black arrows tell us about speciation times. The um, orange arrows tell us about the um, coalescent times. Um, and we can see just an example of a gene tree drawn within a species tree. Um, we will assume Kingman's coalescent, which tells us that times to coalescent events are exponentially distributed within a population with a rate that depends on the number of lineages available for coalescence. And then assuming independence across populations, we can compute the probability density function for a gene tree and associated set of coalescent times conditional on a particular species tree with a set of speciation times. And then we can use that to compute site pattern probabilities because remember from the introduction that what we want to get back to is phylogenetic invariance and site pattern probabilities. And so here is the formula that lets us compute site pattern probabilities under the coalescent model. It looks pretty messy, so let's um, look at it in pieces. So this part highlighted in pink now is just our usual likelihood for sequence data observed from a gene tree. So our gene tree, again, is the topology G with the set of um, coalescent times T. And we can think about any of the common um, nucleotide substitution models. So most of the results in the talk today will apply to the GTR plus I plus gamma model and all submodels. Um, so we have a, a, an assumed model of nucleotide substitution. Um, and then the second piece there, um, now highlighted in blue, is the um, probability density function for the gene tree with its um, coalescent times conditional on the species tree and the set of speciation times. And then because we don't observe the gene trees directly, we need to integrate over the branch lengths within the gene tree and some over the set of gene tree histories. And that integral and sum is what make this a very, very complicated problem. Doing that will give us then the site pattern probabilities coming from the species tree. And that's what we'd like to use for inference. OK, so now that we have the basic idea of what we'd like to use for inference, I'd like to talk about three particular problems for which invariants provide what I claim is both a computationally feasible and statistically sound OK, so we'll um, now talk about the three problems um, of interest here um, that use invariance to, um, as the approach. So um, first, I'd like to talk about using invariance for species tree inference. Um, and I have some references there for the, for the work. Um, so we'll return to the idea of edge invariance that we saw at the beginning of the talk and that Marta introduced to us originally. Um, but now I want the entries of this flattening matrix to represent the site pattern probabilities under the coalescent model. Okay, so we'll think of this in the coalescent case. Um, and what we can think about is, you know, what the rank of this matrix should be. We saw that in the case where we only have a single underlying gene history that the rank should be four. But the question is, what about if we have many underlying coalescent histories, um, his gene tree histories that come from the coalescent process. Um, and if we think about this, um, we can think of, you know, what happens for, say, um, column AC, that means that taxon 3 has an A and 4 has a C, um, and column CA, where 3 has a C and 4 has an A. And you might guess by looking at the tree that I've shown there that if the flattening comes from that tree, that these two columns should have equal probabilities, equal entries. The probability should be equal under the model. Um, it turns out that that's a little bit subtle to show. You have to sort of think about all of the histories. But it is, in fact, true that these will have equal probabilities. And um, as probably this audience knows, that if these two columns are identical, the matrix rank will be reduced by 1. And as it turns out, there's nothing special about A and C. This will also be true for G and T and T and G, for example, and all of the other pairs. And in total, there are six of those pairs, so that the matrix rank is all actually reduced by six. And for this 16 by 16 matrix under the coalescent model, if the flattening is generated from the true tree, the rank will be 10. And so here's a statement of that theorem in a slightly more general setting where we could have any number kappa of states at the tips. So for DNA sequence data, kappa is 4. Um, and we say here we just need a k-state analytic model. For the DNA sequence setting, this will be GTR plus I plus gamma um, and any um, submodel. 
So in that case, we'll have that the rank of the flattening matrix is less than or equal to kappa plus 1 choose 2, 10 in the case of DNA sequence data. And if we make the matrix for something that's not the true tree, then the rank will be strictly greater than this. Um, in fact, the rank is 16. Um, the second main result is that we can use these relationships on four taxon trees to build up to um, infer the species tree for any number of taxa. Um, and then a final result that's very, very recent, but that I'm very excited about, um, is um, that the, the results hold even when the molecular clock is not satisfied and even when there's um, variation in population sizes along the tree. Um, so this might seem sort of too good to be true, but it's actually fairly intuitive what happens. Of course, if the molecular clock isn't satisfied, you might guess that those columns no longer have equal probabilities, but it turns out that they're all linear combinations of one another so that you get the same matrix rank being retained. And so this applies um, also in the absence of a molecular clock. So what we wanted to do is sort of use these results to figure out how we could estimate the phylogenetic tree um, if someone gives us a data set. So supposing that we have aligned DNA sequences from NA loci, or we have a collection of SNP data, so just these single nucleotide polymorphisms, can we use this to infer the species tree? Um, and so we've come up with the following algorithm. The idea is to um, think of quartets. Okay, so think of sets of four taxa, and then build the flattening matrix for each of the four taxon trees. Um, and so I've shown them all there. We could put A and B together, taxa A and B together, taxa A and C together, or taxa A and D together. Um, and then for each of these flattening matrices, where we estimate the probability by looking at the frequency of the site pattern in the alignment, um, we'll compute a measure of how close the flattening matrix is to the nearest rank 10 matrix. And we use what we call the SVD score. Um, this is the same score that Marta mentioned um, in her talk for Nick Erickson's algorithm. Um, it's basically for a rank 10 matrix, we would take the sum of the squares of the 11th through 16th singular values and then take the square root of that and that gives us the, the score. And then we pick the tree from the three that has the smallest SVD score. To scale up to larger problems, we either think of generating all quartets, if that's possible because the num total number of taxa is small enough, or we take a random sample of quartets when we have a larger number of taxa. Um, we estimate the quartet relationships for each of the sampled quartets and then use a quartet assembly algorithm to build the tree. The problem of quartet assembly is well studied and has been around for a while and there are several um, different algorithms available. We use nonparametric bootstrapping, the standard nonparametric bootstrap, to um, estimate uncertainty in the um, estimate. And we call the method SVD quartets. Um, it's implemented in the Popstar software. Dave Swafford has done a great job of making this very, very user friendly. And he's worked a, a lot on the quartet assembly part of the algorithm, which I haven't said much about today, but which is a very important part of the algorithm. Um, so it's, it's user friendly and pretty easy to use. So I'm gonna show you some example data sets now where we actually infer the species phylogeny um, to give you an idea of how it scales with data set size and how it performs. So the first example is for Cistruis rattlesnakes. Um, I'm gonna say a little bit about this example because I'm gonna use this data set to illustrate all three of the problems. Um, this is a set of North American rattlesnakes um, that I've worked on with, um, with Dr. Lyle Gibbs, who's in the EEOB department here at OSU. Um, and Lyle is very interested in learning about the evolutionary relationships among the snakes for several reasons. One is the diversity of venoms that are present in the various species and subspecies, and also from our conservation standpoint, because some of the population sizes are pretty small. Um, so here's a map of the sampling and the distribution of these rattlesnakes in North America. There are two um, subspecies. So Cistruis catnatus um, is, one of, is one of the species, sorry, two species, one of the species, and it's divided into three subspecies that are shown in the primary colors, so the red, the blue, and the green um, toward the, the top of the map here. Um, and um, it's divided into the three subspecies, and that's what the coloring represents. The black dots represent sampling location. Um, there in the southeast U.S. in the pastel colors is the other species, Cisterus miliarius, um, again divided into three subspecies. So in our analysis, we considered seven tips of the tree, the, the six subspecies, three belonging to each species, as well as an outgroup, which in this case was a kistrodon. There were a total of 26 individuals and therefore 52 sequences since they're diploid, and we had a total of 19 genes. 
And if we run um, SVD quartets in POP, it takes about 11 minutes to sample all quartets and do 100 bootstrap replicates. Um, and we get the species tree that's shown here. The um, numbers on the nodes are the bootstrap support values. And this um, particular phylogenetic estimate agrees very closely with um, all of the other coalescent-based um, analyses that we've done, including some computationally intensive analyses, such as Star Beast. Um, we see very strong support for the two species. And within the um, Cistruis catnatus species, so those are the ones that begin with S.C, um, um, we have um, pretty strong support for a subgrouping of um, Edwardsii with Tergeminus. While in the other species, Cisturus miliarius, we only have we we have very strong support for that as a species, but much, very weak support on a particular um, grouping of the of the subspecies. So again, very consistent with other analyses. Um, just to give an example of a, a larger scale data set, um, here is a data set on mammals that's been used um, by several. Um, different researchers, um, including several other um, coalescent-based phylogenetic analysis methods. Um, this has, a, a yes, so, so what I concluded about the snakes was just that this particular estimate from SVD quartets matches things that we get with other more computationally intensive coalescent-based analyses. Um, and so the next example was a data set for mammals. Um, this data set has a total of 37 taxa, so 36 mammal species in an outgroup. Um, and there's, it's much larger scale, so 1.4 million base pairs and 447 genes. Um, and we ran SVD quartets on a pretty old um, dual-core Linux machine, um, which took about 27 hours to estimate the tree and obtain bootstrap support from 100 replicates. So that may seem long unless you've tried to run some of the other coalescent-based methods, which can take you know several days up to weeks and, and possibly more. So um, this tree also was very similar to some of those more computationally intensive analyses. OK, so the second problem that I wanted to talk about was using invariance to root the phylogenetic tree. Um, and um, here's the basic idea. So if you look at the, this figure, there's a tree right in the middle that's an unrooted tree. Um, and it's the, the tree that has the red dots on it. So there are four taxa here again, A, B, C, and D. And this unrooted tree in the middle has taxa A and B most closely related and taxa C and D most closely related. And if we think about how to root this tree, there are five potential root positions that we could identify on the tree. Those are marked with the red dots. What we're going to try to do is see if we can find phylogenetic invariants that will help us distinguish these five root positions. So we'll think first about a particular root position, position one, and we'll assume the Jukes Canner 69 model, um, which is easiest to think about, and then I'll talk about generalization of that eventually. Um, so if we think about this tree, which has A sort of as the outgroup, and then B, C, and D clustered together with C and D sister, and we consider the, the relationship between these two site pattern probabilities. So P, Y, X, X, X. That means that Y has, uh, that, that um, taxon A has a particular nucleotide Y, and taxa B, C, and D have a different nucleotide. And I'm thinking about Duke's Canner 69, so all that matters is whether they're the same or different, not the particular choice of nucleotide, which is why I don't have specific letters here. Um, and suppose I compare that to the probability that X, C, and D all share the same nucleotide, sorry, A, C, and D all share the same nucleotide, and B has um, a different nucleotide. Well, the probability of the first one, where A is different than B, C, and D, seems reasonable that that probability would be higher than the second one, where Y is the one that has a different nucleotide. We could also think about these two site patterns. These are just assigning a different nucleotide to C or D and having the other three be the same. And it's reasonable to think that these should have equal probability under this model, where again, the branch, the, the branch lengths are meaningful. So we have the molecular clock being satisfied. So these, these two um, relationships in the site pattern probability together, when we see both of these, these would indicate to us that root position one is the correct root position. Um, for each of the five root positions, we can then write out the expected relationships. And we're only using these four um, site pattern probabilities to do it. And what we can do is then develop formal hypothesis tests for each of the expected relationships, and then use the outcome of those tests to root the phylogenetic tree. And it turns out the relationships hold for more general models, so up to GTR. You just have to keep track then of if it's 
if you know y is a and x is c, that will be different than if y is g and x is t, but the expected relationships, the direction of the relationships will be the same. However, the method is sensitive to the molecular clock assumption. Um, so that was for four taxa. Again, we'd like to um, extend up to um, a larger number of taxa. Um, so we'll think of doing things sort of similarly to the last problem where we look at quartet relationships. And I believe this is where we left off? Yeah. Okay, so, so now we can think of sampling quartets from the larger tree. So the tree in A ha now has six taxa, and we're going to think of trying to infer the root for the tree in A. Um, we could start by sampling the four taxa A, B, C, and F, which would lead to the tree in B. And let's suppose that we infer the root to be on the branch labeled H. Um, we would then have one vote for that quartet for the root being on branch H. Alternatively, I could sample taxa E, B, C, and D. Okay, And if I did that and inferred the root to be on the central branch, the central branch is actually G, H, and I. So they're high, it's highlighted in red there in panel A. And in that case, I would take my one vote and I would distribute it evenly over branches G, H, and I. So they'd each get a count of a third. We do this for all the quartets. And then we choose as the root the branch that contains the largest weight um, at the end of the process. And so as an example, we can apply this again to the rattlesnake data set. Um, I've shown the unrooted tree for the rattlesnake data set there on the left. Um, you may remember that the outgroup um, is Achistrodon, and we have two different um, samples from the Achistrodon. Um, and then we have the other uh, six tips, three from each species. And for each of the labeled branches, I've shown the weight when we run this algorithm. And scanning down the list, you can see that the weight associated with branch 9 is the largest. Um, the weight is 31. And it's by far larger than any of the other weights. If you sort of scan down, you'll see that there are a couple other branches that get relatively large weight. And they're sort of sensible ones. So branches 1 and 2 lead to um, the two outgroup individuals. Um, and they have values just under 10. And branches 10 and 11, um, 10 and 12, sorry, are ones that separate the one of the subspecies, one of the species from the others. Um, but it's clear that the, the um, preferred root here is actually the true root, branch 9. OK, finally, um, I'd like to talk about using invariants to identify hybrid taxa. And so the idea here was to develop a model that includes both the coalescent process and the process of hybridization. So um, I think I'd better just quickly say what I mean by the process of hybridization. The idea is that we have two distinct species which come together, interbreed, and eventually this leads to formation of a new hybrid species. So the tree in the very left there, to the left of the equal sign, the one labeled hybrid species tree, shows an example of this. We have, starting at the top of the tree, a speciation event in which the outgroup labeled O is separated from the ancestor of the other taxa. We have a second speciation event in which P1 and P2 become distinct species. And then there's this horizontal event, um, which is represented by the lowest horizontal dotted line there. And at that point, P1 and P2 come into contact, and they produce a new species labeled H, which is the hybrid species. The idea there is that when this happens, Taxon H should share part of its history with P2 and part of its history with P1. So on the right side, after the equal sign, we have you know, two different trees that are sort of added together in this model. And the idea is that we have, the, for thinking about the evolutionary relationships for species H, we have it sharing a common ancestor with, P2, with um, parent 2 with probability gamma and with parent 1, P1, with probability 1 minus gamma. What we can do is we can use our site pattern probabilities from under the coalescent model from the beginning of the talk, and we can now just write this as a mixture of the two trees. So if we look at the line here that says for the network, we'll see that the probability of site pattern I given species tree S is just gamma times the probability given species tree 1 plus 1 minus gamma given the pro times the probability given species tree 2. And so now we have site pattern probabilities, but we have them under this coalescent and hybridization model. Our idea then is to use functions of these new hybrid PIs to form test statistics and for a formal hypothesis test of hybridization and possibly um, 
So again, we were going to try to, um, to uh, take the model for hybridization where we have weights on the two possible parental trees and write down site pattern probabilities, which are mixtures of the site pattern probabilities from these two trees with weight gamma and use these to form test statistics um, for a formal hypothesis test or possibly to estimate gamma. So we can identify F1 and F2, which are um, two uh, um, polynomials in the site pattern frequencies, where again, X and Y represent same or different in terms of the nucleotides. Um, some people will notice that F2 is the relationship that the ABBA-BABA test is based on, if, you're, if you've um, looked at these kinds of analyses before. And we can show that um, for the true values of the PI, that the ratio of F1 to F2 is gamma over 1 minus gamma, and we can use that to formulate hypotheses hypothesis tests um, and to estimate gamma. Um, so again, that was a model for four taxa, so we want to build up to larger trees. We'll consider three taxa plus an outgroup, so quartets again, and we'll look at all possible assignments of the three in-group taxa to parent one, hybrid, and parent two, and carry out all three statistical tests. And we'll do this for all um, sets of quartets, so we'll need an adjustment for multiple comparisons. Um, so we can carry out all tests with one individual selected from each species for all sets of four species and all individuals within the species. For the, so for the rattlesnake example, this is about 15,680 comparisons, so we reduce our alpha level pretty substantially. And the result is that we find no evidence of hybridization for the rattlesnake data set. Um, this is actually a relief because other um, work on this group had also indicated that there was not hybridization in this group, even though there's sort of a hybrid zone in Missouri, a hypothesized hybrid zone in Missouri, um, where people thought there might be hybridization going on. None of the molecular analyses have supported that, and this analysis didn't either. As a second example, and again to highlight the ability of these invariants to deal with large-scale data, um, we thought about using genome-scale data for the Heliconius butterflies. Um, I have the paper reference there, and in their original analysis, they constructed maximum likelihood gene trees for 100 kilobase regions of the genome, and they, they found the, this, um, you know, representing all of those gene trees in the figure on the right, they see that this individual, um, this Rosina individual, appears to be hybrid between the two parents, sometimes with the gene tree that is in blue and sometimes with the gene tree that is in red. And so this looks like a very nice example of hybrid speciation. So um, we ran this um, through our method. There were a total of 13 sequences, and this is pretty large-scale data, so 248 million base pairs. Um, there are a total of 128 relevant comparisons, so we used a Bonferroni correction to use a significance level of 0 0.00039. The total time for all of these comparisons was about 16 minutes on, again, my old desktop Linux machine. And the result in this case was that all comparisons are significant, which is really not too surprising given the size of the data. But if we look carefully, all of the comparisons that have the Rosina individual as the hybrid had very large test statistics, larger than 172. All other comparisons had test statistics less than 76, and in most cases, much less. The test statistic is being compared to a normal distribution. So for reference, these are quite large. 172 would be quite large as a test statistic. Um, so it was easily able to identify the, the hybrid taxa. OK, so what I've tried to convince you of, and it wasn't probably as compelling when the internet connection kept dropping, but I tried to convince you that invariants are very useful in the coalescent setting. So I want to just con conclude by trying to understand what features of invariants make, it so, make them so useful for the coalescent setting. Um, and I think that there are very, three different perspectives that OK, so, so I think there's three perspectives that um, will, will let us see why invariants might be so useful in this case. The first is just that we really do have very large-scale phylogenomic data these days, and it's very easy to think of summarizing this data as site pattern frequencies that just involves counting which category the columns in the alignment fall in. And I want to go back to something Marta mentioned, which is the quote from Joe Felsenstein's book, where he said that invariants are worth attention not for what they can do for us now, but what they might lead to in the future. And I think part of this future is really processing this genome scale data set, where summarizing the data as site pattern probabilities becomes a really efficient way to think about things. Um, the next perspective is the statistical perspective, and I didn't go into a lot of the, um, the theory behind the hypothesis test, but essentially site patterns are observations from a multinomial distribution. It's a large and complicated multinomial distribution, but it's still at the end of the day just a multinomial distribution, which is statistically very well understood. 
The other good news is that asymptotics apply. We have tons of um, data. We have many, many site patterns observed. And so we can use large sample results, which again are very well understood from the multinomial distribution, to really look at things in a nice statistical context. Text. Um, finally is the algebraic perspective, and here's where large and complex might be a strength because that lends itself to algebraic structure that we can exploit to learn about these probability distributions. And so far we've used this algebraic structure to um, prove identifiability and then derive estimation procedures um, from the results that we've, we've gotten. So I see this as a very, very promising avenue for, for future work when we have these very, very large data sets. Um, I'll conclude then just um, with acknowledging the um, people who have contributed to this work. Julia Schiffman and I began thinking about site pattern probabilities for the coalescent model quite a while ago um, and um, have been very happy to see that it looks so promising now. Dave Swafford has programmed everything in Popstar, so you can try it out and have a very nice um, user interface. Um, Colby Long is the current postdoc at the MBI at OSU who is working on this stuff and who has um, derived the results that show that it's robust to the assumption of a molecular clock. Um, Paul Blischok is working on the, the hybridization um, project right now, along with Julia. And Yuan Tian, um, the rooting work was part of her PhD dissertation. Um, and um, funding, various funding from uh, NSF supported this work. So to conclude, I'll thank you all for your extreme patience if you're still watching after we had so much trouble with the connection. And I'm happy to answer any questions. All right. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, that, that was a beautiful talk. Um, yeah, no worries about uh, things dropping out. So yeah, so we'll take questions either through IRC. Uh, we, there are still some folks left. Uh, so if you want to ask a question, um, just tweet at file seminar and um, or you can chat on IRC. Um, so I guess so. So the theory went by a little bit fast. Um, so it, can you clarify a little bit about um, how it, it seemed to me that pretty much it seemed like. The, for the for the species tree was pretty much the same as you would use for a gene tree, and is 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 that correct? I mean, so the um, the ideas are largely the same. The difference is that the rank result. Um, so for the edge invariance, the rank result is different. So if you're working with a gene tree, the rank of that matrix is four, and if you're working with the species tree, the rank of the matrix is ten. Um, so that's the primary difference between them. The implementation in POP will, will allow you to um, set the rank to be whatever you want. So you could do a gene tree based inference in the same way in POP star, or you can pick the species tree based inference. Um, and so there's a lot of flexibility there. Um, it turns out that, that the method, the SVD quartets method, doesn't work so well for single gene data because any individual gene is relatively short. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're sort of estimating a 16 by 16 matrix by you know uh, whatever the length of our alignment is, right? And so if you want to estimate those probabilities well, it helps a lot to have more data. It's typically longer than the length of a gene, but it it, it could it works? It's valid theoretically valid for that case, um, and can work as well. So the big difference is just that the rank is different when we assume the coalescent model versus when we assume that there's only a single underlying gene tree. Right. I mean, it's just sort of interesting. I mean, there there is so much more going on in the like the gene tree coalescent model, but somehow. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Somehow it's there's a nice con convenient rank result that comes from looking at that flattening. So. Yeah. You don't have other questions. I mean, so, if, so if you did want to, I mean, one of the advantages, of course, of the Bayesian framework is that you can get other parameters like ancestral things like that. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way to sort of like post hoc integrate that sort of thing in to your analysis? So it turns out that you can actually, and we're working on this now, although it didn't make its way into the talk, um, you can actually derive branch length estimates under this model as well, for example. Um, so you can actually write an estimator for the length of a branch in the species tree as a function of the site pattern probabilities, which is lovely because it's instantaneously computed, right, as soon as you process the alignment. And you can get variances because all of the probabilities are just observations from a multinomial. So you can get variances as well if you have the patience to sort of write down all the covariances. Um, so it is it is very possible to do that. And so we have explicit expressions written for the Jukes-Canner model um, and a lot of the coding done. And um, 
the other models are harder um, because it's harder to express the site pattern probabilities for the other models. So um, we're thinking about ways to, to uh, sort of use the Duke Scanner framework to generalize to the other models. Um, but if the data really come from the Duke Scanner model, it works great, and you can get really, <laughs> really quick estimates of the branch length. So I think it is promising, and I think we will. Um, so the short answer is yes. I think that will be possible to get estimates of the parameters as well, um, and hopefully in a in a um, also in a computationally feasible framework. Yep. Very cool. Um, is there a sense um, in which some of these things are sort of like optimal estimators? I mean, maybe. So I've only started to think about that, um, and particularly how they relate to ML estimators, to maximum likelihood estimators. So what's the relationship between those? For the branch length case, the maximum likelihood estimators are not equivalent to the estimators that we get by using the algebraic expressions. Um, and so, you know, what, which, which are optimal or how that works or what classical stat theory applies to this weird situation is something I've just started to think about. So I don't have a good answer to that, but I think it's extremely interesting um, to, to see, to see what, what's what. So, so hopefully more to come on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the hybrid thing is really interesting as well. Um, I guess it didn't quite take the turn that I thought it was going to. In the, like, is there any hope to have, like, like a network invariant directly or something like that. I mean, I, I, I the way that you do it, estimating these gammas. Uh, but yeah, I just wondered if there's sort of like a more direct method somehow. Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. I mean, I believe that network invariants exist. I believe that there are these things that could help us distinguish network versus non-network and different things. The problem is they're so hard to find because we can't, we don't even, you know, we have the entire site pattern probability distribution um, written down and sort of coded in Mathematica. It's a supplement to one of the papers um, for four taxa, but for five taxa, we, we don't even, we can't write the site pattern probabilities um, in any, you know, ex explicitly. So we could simulate them, but then that doesn't give you the insight to find the, the patterns that you need. So I really believe the problem has enough structure that these things exist, and I have no idea how to go about finding them. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I, it would be great, and I, I think it's true, but I, I don't have a lot of insight, and it, it just it gets even more complicated under the coalescent model. If you, if you could just assume a single gene tree, then you could probably guess them, maybe. But once you have the coalescent and you have contributions from all these different gene trees and you think of more than four taxa and networks, it becomes really tough, at least for me, to think about. So. Yeah. For sure. So we have a question from Cecile, who I can only guess is Cecile Ine. Uh, uh, for hybrid detection, you run a series of tests with multiple test adjustment, detection of where the introgression is, if indeed there is an introgression. So sorry, I missed the question. Um, so the question is, for hybrid detection, you run a series of tests with multiple test adjustment. Can you follow up with the detection of where the introgression is if indeed there is an introgression? Right, so each of the tests um, will um, consider an assignment of a taxa to the hybrid and assignment of two other taxa to the parents. And so that collection of three would be implicated in the event. Um, so that's how you would know where it's at. So if it's really hybrid speciation, you should be able to identify which is the hybrid and which are the parents. Um, and we have uh, a bunch of simulation studies that test that, that to, to see if it can really pick it up when we know the answer. Um, if the question is more about introgression, though, and not hybrid speciation, um, we do believe that it picks that up um, and are hoping to spend some time this summer really simulating that um, specific phenomenon to make sure that our intuition about that is right. Um, but but I do believe it will pick up introgression as well. But my guess is, I wondered actually if she meant like it, uh, on the span of the genome where... Oh, right, yeah, 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 okay. I see, yeah, I see what, you're, you're, what she's asking. Um, so it doesn't, it won't do that specifically because it's just treating, it's treating the data in aggregate. It's sort of adding up all the site pattern probabilities across the whole genome and looking for overall evidence. Um, it would be possible to run the test in, say, sliding windows along a chromosome or along the genome and sort of 
um, plot the test statistic as you move along the chromosome and see where the value of the test statistic spikes. That might be a, an intragress region or at least see how things change as you move along the genome. And I've thought about doing that but haven't managed to find time to implement it. But I think it's a, it's a good suggestion. The, um, the paper that I have recently with Elizabeth Allman and John Rhodes, we do something sort of similar um, where we have a, a score which is essentially the same as the SBD score and we move along the chromosome and look for changes in the score and that does seem to pick up events like this. So my guess is that um, something like that would work well in this case as well. And again, another nice example of invariance. So she follows up with a, another question. She said, in the full tree, the hybrid could be an ancestral species, not a single species. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so we can detect those and if hybridization between ancestral taxa, but it's much more work at, in the present implementation for the investigator to pull those out of the results file. So what happens is if you have, so you have a hybridization event, and then there's speciation, and then further divergence. What happens is that any descendant of that hybridization event will be inferred as a hybrid between any parent from the ancestral lineages. So you get lots of significant test results involving those hybrids. And if you sort of draw them all out on the tree, you can reconstruct it. So I've done this for a couple data sets. It's tedious, but it does the right thing. Um, we thought some about whether we can automate that a little bit for people and really try to pull those out. And that's definitely what we're thinking of working on, um, but haven't done anything formal with that. So it's the sort of signal is there. It's just a question of how can we best put that together and really identify that. But it will pick up um, ancestral hybridization. You definitely get a signal for that. Yes. OK, well, I, I, I don't see any other questions. Um, again, thank you for the lovely talk. Um, and well, I don't know what to say, but uh, <laughs> that was a lot of technical difficulties. Uh, yes. I assume you weren't using your old Linux laptop or desktop for uh, doing this. <laughs> this. This machine is less than a year old, and I've used it for this purpose before. So I really apologize to everybody. I don't know. I feel like someone was flipping an internet switch in my building or something. So um, my <laughs> apologies, and I oh, thanks to everyone who stuck with it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, thanks again, and yeah, I guess next will be Barbara Holland. All right, okay. bye now. <laughs>